I couldn't just sit by after what I'd heard. I and Jafia Nora gently stepped along the thickly carpeted floor of her aunt's large office. After being let inside by one of her aunt's assistants, after a bit of sweet convincing, she now did her best to not pull any attention onto herself, and she tried to not make any sounds while she approached the office's main room. Due to their size, Zodiatos weren't exactly known as the most subtle of species, of course, but Aegifianora had always prided herself in being pretty sneaky, at least for her people. It also helped that all the doors around this place were very clearly designed to be opened by Zodiatos specifically. Not that other species couldn't have gotten them open, at least some of the larger ones like Hinplod or Ligamordalar. But she doubted that they could have done so quite as soundlessly as she could. She did her absolute best to not make a single sound as she moved the massive wooden doors out of the way with gentle position of her trunk. She really didn't want her aunt to notice her before she got the chance to yell out, Surprise! Ever since all this had started, she had barely seen her aunt. She had been so busy and closed off, always focused on her work, and she tried to figure out just where things had gone wrong for everything to escalate like it had. Ijefi and Nora had really hoped that her aunt and James would manage to patch things up, although she of course understood that after the death of her father, that would be very difficult. The last time she had really seen her aunt was at the eulogy, and there even the mighty high matriarch had seemed distraught. But Ijefi and Nora was sure that it had to have been a misunderstanding. It just had to, though... Admittedly, she herself was far less sad about the death of Dorofren than most others seemed to be, despite sharing half of her genes with the ball. Still, she really hoped her visit could somewhat distract her aunt from the bad things happening in the galaxy. And maybe, with a better mood, she could go about her work in a lighter manner as well. Maybe IJ Fionora could even offer to talk to James and clear up the misunderstanding. After all, it had seemed like the human had at least liked her a bit when they met. He had even allowed her to touch his head. Back then, she had been delighted because he was so cute, but now, maybe that respect could be used a bit more productively. Maybe he would listen to her when she told him how he must have misunderstood something. But, first and foremost, she would have to cheer up her aunt. Very, very quietly, she opened the last door that would lead her in the direction of her aunt's main office. She put her foot down so gently that one could think that she was walking on eggshells as her wide feet sank into the thick carpeting. Her large ears fluttered in excitement once her trunk let go of the door as soon as it was out of the way, and as she very slowly sneaked closer and closer to the door to her aunt's main office, she noticed that it wasn't closed entirely. It was open just a crack and some light gently flooded out from the inside. Ija Fionora's ears fluttered even more as they then picked up on her aunt's voice. It seemed like she was talking to someone. Oh no, that might be important, she thought to herself for a moment, figuring that potentially bursting into a call with some important figure, while loudly yelling surprise, might not exactly be appreciated. However, she also didn't exactly trust herself to turn around and move back to the waiting area without making any unnecessary noise, so she decided to wait right here. Of course, eavesdropping on an important conversation wasn't exactly a good thing either, but it wasn't like she was eavesdropping on purpose. She just had to wait here until her aunt was done with her conversation. Besides, it wasn't like her aunt had never shown or told her things she wasn't exactly meant to see. She giggled mischievously into herself as she waited, and her ears inadvertently began to pick up on the conversation as it proceeded. Contact them anyway, a vaguely familiar voice said from the inside. We're going to need them for what happens next. Aija Fionora tried to remember where she had heard that voice before, but she couldn't put her finger on it. Then, her aunt replied, 
I hope you know what you are doing, Alexander, she said. Right, Alexander. She remembered that voice. It had been another human that her aunt had in her office at some point, to clear things up with the human government. She remembered hearing him during a brief call she had with her aunt shortly after it all happened. We can't afford to give out any more information than we strictly need to. I know that, Alexander's voice replied. Only fill them in on the most important parts, and then tell them to contact me. Very well, Aunt Apo said. Success to you. Then it seemed like she hung up her call, as the light coming from the cracked open door flickered a bit, before dimming significantly. Aijifi and Nora quickly tried to use the opportunity to sneak closer to the room, hoping she could make it before her aunt could start the next call. Alas, her careful steps were too slow, and soon she saw the light shift again, as she heard the sound of a new call connecting. What unexpected honour, High Matriarch? The melodic voice of a Kaluvari soon answered the call, and Aijifi and Nora recognised it as Warrant Officer Haifati, one of Reprieg's colleagues. Is there finally an update on our situation? Aunt Apo replied without any delay. There is indeed, Warrant Officer. I am sorry for the delay, but I am sure you understand. How are you faring? She inquired in a professionally polite and firm tone. According to the circumstances, Haifati replied, her voice sounding like a plucked string instrument that was dampened with a finger. It was... No less than extremely unnerving living under these circumstances. However, we have managed to convince ourselves that we aren't going to die at any moment. At least for the time being. We are, however, more than ready to leave. I sympathize with that, Aunt Apo replied to that. And I have good news. It can very well be that you won't have to stay long any more. Alexander has requested that you contact him. Alexander... Haifati repeated the name for a moment before clearing her throat. And you request that we do what he asks us to? Only after getting back to me about it, of course, Aunt Apo replied. Of course, Haifati repeated. Very well, I shall contact him. And the realised will not be a problem? I am sure it will not hear anything that will cause any trouble, Aunt Apo replied. Aijia Nora flinched slightly. The realised. So they were dealing with that. She could still hardly believe that there truly was one alive today. And not only that, but it was also supposedly friendly? It was difficult to believe. However, she couldn't say that she didn't at least listen when James had spoken about it on the news. And what he said did make sense. It seemed peaceful. And shouldn't they give it the chance to stay peaceful if it wanted to? The humans were suspicious people, after all, so if they gave it a chance, why shouldn't others? She really hoped her aunt was at least considering the possibility, even if his existence surely put her into a very difficult situation, especially after what the captain had done. Or had it been the councilman, like James has said? She didn't quite know what to believe. Very well, Haifati replied to the High Matriarch's words. Then she cleared her throat once more. If I may allow myself the comment, during our uncontacted time here, we have been following the current developments with some worries, especially the more unforeseen parts. Do you think everything will take a good end? Everything is still under control, Aunt Apo assured the officer. However, she then paused, and her voice turned a bit more serious as she added, but be sure to thoroughly inform me about anything Alexander tells you and wants you to do, all right? We wouldn't want that fact changing, after all. Very well, ma'am, Haifati replied. I shall inform everyone. Anything else? Nothing right now. Make sure there aren't any more avoidable surprises, Aunt Apo said at first, before quickly correcting herself. Oh, actually, there is one thing. Since you are still in the system, see if you can't pick up some... My, what was the word? Claudie tensors or something? And then send them to me. 
There was a request for those. I thought I would have to order them, but this might be easier. There was a bit of a pause. Humans don't have claws, Hyphati replied, with mild confusion after a moment. They sure don't, Aunt Apo replied. There was another moment of silence. Understood, ma'am, Hyphati then finally said. Success to you. Success to you, her aunt replied. Then the light in the room dimmed again as the call cut out. She then heard her aunt sigh and mumble something to herself under her breath. She couldn't make it out, but it sounded disappointed. However, although the exchanger sounded incredibly innocuous in nature, something in Ijifianora's mind had just somehow clicked at that last exchange. Humans don't have claws. The words just echoed through her mind over and over again, and she didn't even know why. If she was being honest with herself, her belief in basically everything had been hanging on by a thread. Deep down she knew there was never a misunderstanding, yet she had thrown a blanket over that knowledge and tied it up with that single thread to keep it out of sight. And no matter how much she saw that indicated otherwise, she had hid it all away underneath that blanket, never even considering how true it all might have been. However, those words... I don't know why, but just hearing that made it all unravel in my mind, Igea Fionora said with a sigh and a slightly shaking voice. Nuff Mirdura friend had reached over to her trunk with his own, and they wrapped around each other in a supporting gesture, as I.J. Fionora looked down at the small human as she explained it all. I... I think I wanted to be blind to it. I just didn't want to believe it, but for some reason just that sentence pulled the wall from my eyes, and I can't even tell you why. Humans don't have claws, but me at sure do. But Auntie doesn't work with the Miat, especially not now. However, I've never heard of claw detensors, so most must not use them. Why not? Because retractable claws don't get tense, and not many species have retractable claws. I read up on it on the way here. Everything just kind of fell into place, because of something so dumb. Like I said, I have no proof of anything, but I'm sure of it. And something about your reaction tells me it's not as crazy as I thought it might be. James had listened to her explanations quietly. He looked around at his friends, who surrounded him, both human and not. Finally, he said, No, it's not. It was... maybe a bit more than two weeks ago. It all seemed fine. At least it did to me, but I was the only one who didn't have a bad feeling about it. Crazy that there are still space drifters around in a time like this, Rekka said, and tapped her foot against the crate she was sitting on nervously. Well, where wants to talk, Will replied with a shrug, while leaning against the wall and scratching the inside of his ear. We're basically space drifters as well at this point. Why shouldn't other people be? Rekka made an annoyed grunting sound. Because we have a damn good reason not to go back to Earth, she then replied in a very annoyed mumble. Will shrugged again. So do they, probably, he said nonchalantly. And if that's the case, it's probably best not to ask too many questions. Their business isn't ours. Our business is to provide them with what they pay for. Rekka sighed deeply. Well... I still think it's strange, she said, in an untypically thoughtful tone. I mean, did you see those symbols around their necks? What if it's some weird space cult? Will just tilted his head at her. The star-framed cross? He asked in mild surprise. It's a religious symbol of the Fell Saviour. Don't tell me you've never heard of them. Rekka's gaze turned up to him in surprise. Should I have? she asked, sounding seriously confused. Will released a deep scoff. 
It's only one of the biggest religions on earth, he said, and laughed to himself at his friend's confused looks. He got us an answer. In a tease, he added, I'm still not entirely convinced you weren't raised by wolves. As she leaned forward slightly, with her body language turning seriously upset for a moment, Will took the hint and very quickly changed the topic. Well, anyway, I'll take business with strange humans over business with strange Xenos any day, but especially these days, he said with some conviction, hoping to pull Wrecker along so she couldn't linger on his previous comment. However, Wrecker stared at him for a moment, before hanging her head down slightly. Come on, you know we're not supposed to call them Xenos, she said in a disgruntled mumble, although her tone sounded almost held back, like she didn't want to start a fight over it. Will let out an annoyed breath. What? You had a crush on one alien girl and suddenly you're the speech police? He asked her fastidiously. You know I don't use it as an insult. They're just Xenos, you know, originally. That means something like friends from elsewhere or something like that. Rekka let out another sigh. Let's not do this, she then mumbled again, and shook her head a bit. Agreed, Will said, with his arms crossed. After a bit of awkward silence that followed their short conversation, the door to their cargo hold opened, and Otto walked in. He held a tablet he seemed to use to make some last notes and checks. However, hearing the silence he walked into, he looked up at them. Did I interrupt something? He asked, seeing both Will and Wrecker sit there and stare into empty space. They both quickly shook their heads. Not at all, Wrecker said. Nah, Will agreed. We were just thinking about all the things we can go do after this score. It's not a fortune, but we'll have the funds to do some fun things. I say we find us some semi-aquatic station and have an extended pool party. Wrecker shook her head slightly, and Otto let out a long exhale. Well, don't count the money just yet, he said, and brought his knuckles to his chin as he looked over at the crate that Wrecker was sitting on. Did you check the wares like I asked you to? He asked her, in a voice that spoke of some deep thoughts going on in that head of his. Wrecker nodded. Thirty high-end breath filters, military style, all present, accounted for, and most importantly, functional, she said. For military tech? The faces they make for you when you talk are actually pretty cute, she then added, in an apparent attempt to lighten her own mood a bit. Otto nodded. Good. I can't wait for this job to be over, he said, and looked back down at his tablet, presumably to note down that the wares were checked and secured. Will could tell Otto had some strange feeling as well. Not like Otto didn't get strange feelings about most jobs they got. How do you even get your hands on these things? Will therefore asked, once again trying to bring the room's mood around. They fall off a truck or something? Otto scoffed slightly and shook his head. You've got your contacts and I've got mine. Are you going to complain? He then replied and looked at Will with highly raised eyebrows. Not at all, Will replied with a chuckle. Just impressed. You think especially right now the military will keep an extra close eye on their supplies, given that there could always be a conflict right around the next corner. Otto laughed slightly. You just have to know the right people, he said with a mild nod, before putting the tablet away into a bag that was hanging on his hip. Besides... All that extra attention is paid to the important stuff, and with all guard dogs staring at the weapons, there's fewer eyes looking over at something mundane like this. Though of course, it's still a good bit harder than just picking up a few breath filters extra from a normal supplier. He turned a bit thoughtful towards that last part, and Will quickly tried to pull the mood back around yet again. And that's what we get to charge extra for, he laughed, with a nudging gesture in Ortel's direction. Although he was of course way too far away to actually touch him. How much danger bonus did you manage to cut out of these poor schmucks? 
Ortle smirked for a moment. However, then Will's words backfired, as his friends seemed to turn even more thoughtful than before. A good 50%, he said. And these things are already a good bit pricier than the ones you can pick up in a normal market. Somehow, he didn't exactly sound happy about that. Is there a problem? Rekka asked, clearly also picking up on Ortle's tone. Ortle shook his head and sighed. Just wondering about the price, he said. This is a lot of money and effort for some breath filters. Will shrugged. It's the price you pay for wanting to get some without going back to Earth. Especially if you want the good ones, he said. The price of convenience. And we both know people are willing to pay that. Rekka leaned a bit more forwards and narrowed her eyes. How hard did you have to haggle with them for the price? She asked in a suspicious tone. Almost like she was trying to find another catch in the entire thing. Otto shook his head a bit almost as if he knew what she was thinking, and wanted to preemptively deny it. Pretty down hard. They had some good hagglers, he said, in a tone that was a bit too serious. Usually he'd laugh about haggling. Took nearly an hour before we agreed on a price, and it was even a bit lower than I originally planned. Think he got duped? Will asked, after hearing Ortle's serious tone. Ortle shook his head again, no, it's still good money, it's just... He started, and Will sighed. You've got a weird feeling, he finished his friend's sentence. Otto nodded and rubbed his eyes for a moment. I'll just be glad once this job is over. He repeated his earlier sentiment with a long exhale. Right, Will said with a nod. Well, it's not going to be much longer. Then, a couple of days later, we met up with the customer here in the station. I have to say, Mr. Berezi, you are worth every droplet of your reputation, a broad man said, after they had unloaded the crate for him and his people. He was getting up there in the years, and his blondish hair was going strongly towards the grey. However, the old guy still looked like he ate raw eggs with nails for breakfast. He picked up one of the breath filters out of the crate, and inspected it more closely once again. I was half expecting these to not be authentic, but no, you delivered. Worth every penny, I'd say. Will slightly chuckled at the near-ancient expression, but Ortle kept up his professionalism. We do quality work for the right price, Ortle said with a nod, and the old guy laughed at that. You sure do, he agreed. One of the other people, a much smaller man, briefly came walking up to him and whispered something into his ear. Will had pretty good ears, and he very faintly picked up on the small man calling the larger one, Brother Anders. Not that he paid too close attention to that. He didn't need to know their client's name. In fact, it was often better if he didn't. He also didn't hear anything else from the brief conversation, as the whispering man got a lot quieter after gaining his seeming superior's attention. However, after whatever he had to say was conveyed, the smaller man quickly hurried away again, and Brother Anders turned back to Ortle and discussed some last parts of the deal. Will looked around for a moment, while those two were hashing out the finer details. Next to him, he could see Rekka stepping in place without actually lifting her feet, just shifting her weight from one leg onto the other, while periodically lifting just her heels slightly off the ground. He tried not to let it bother him as he scanned over the other people in the room. They all looked pretty chill, all things considered. Sure a bit more on the serious side of things, especially with those religious symbols hanging around their necks, but who was he to judge them? They were still polite and didn't give him any aggressive vibes, just standing around, talking to each other, and seemingly also wanting to get this thing over with. After a couple of minutes, the deal was hashed out in its entirety, and payment had been exchanged. It was a pleasure doing business with you, 
Brother Anders politely said, and gave a restrained bow with his hands folded. Ortal returned the gesture, and then turned to Will and Rekka. It's time to pack up, he said. Will and Rekka didn't complain, as they quickly got ready to leave this place, and Will was already thinking about how they could best invest their newly gained funds. However, as they all walked next to each other and began to make their way towards the exit, Anders spoke up one more time. Oh, I almost forgot one more thing, Mr. Berezi, he said, and waited for Ortel to turn his head back to him before he continued. It's just a formality, really, but these things can't be traced back to us, right? Ortel looked at him for a moment, but then shook his head. No, of course not, he said confidently. Brother Anders smiled at that and nodded. Very good, he said. Will chuckled slightly at the exchange, figuring the guy was worried about the military getting mad for their surplus going missing, and somehow finding them as the perpetrators. However, the chuckle got stuck in his throat, when he suddenly felt himself be tackled to the side by something ramming against him with incredible force. Not even a second later, there was the piercing sound of a heavily suppressed shot firing, followed immediately by a pained grunt right into his ear. Will felt something warm spread across his body as it slowly seeped through his clothing, but before he even fully registered what that meant, Rekka had already shot back up from lying on top of him after the tackle, now holding a gun of her own. Will had no idea where she even got it from. Will saw the flashes of two shots as their accompanying bangs rang out so closely together that they almost sounded like a single one. The bodies of two of the religiously dressed clients crumpled to the ground not far from him shortly after. Then, finally, Will's brain fired back up, and he also began to quickly get back to his feet. He pulled Rekka back up with him, as she was heavily clutching her stomach with one hand. In his periphery, he could see Brother Anders jump out of the way, as Otto had also pulled a gun from seemingly nowhere, and fired a few shots into the room, seemingly more aimed to make everyone take cover, instead of actually intending to hit anybody. Then, he quickly turned and grabbed Will by the arm, as he pulled him and the injured wrecker along to quickly get them out of the room, all the while still firing suppressive shots back, so their attackers would have to keep their heads down. Rekka breathed heavily from pain and the fatigue of blood loss as Will carried her along. Will's mind was ringing, both from the ear-piercing shots of their guns and from the stressful whiplash of events filling his blood with adrenaline. What the hell just happened? They had been set up, clearly, but why? He couldn't think about it. He had to run. And more importantly, he had to get Rekka out of here. She had thrown herself into the shot for him. He looked down at her, as he heard her grunting in pain again. Blood was gradually seeping out of her gut wound, and she tried her best to quell the flow by pressing her hand against it. But although he couldn't see it, he was pretty sure it was flowing just as quickly out of her other side as well. They had to patch her up, and quickly. As he looked ahead, his eyes widened. The end of the hall they had entered through was near, but... The damn door's closed, he realized aloud, unable to keep his voice inside as it truly hit him that they were trapped in here. Not for long, though. Don't slow down, Otto ordered him as he ran past, easily outspeeding Will, and not just because he had to carry Wrecker. Otto sprinted the rest of the hallway in record time and immediately broke open a panel besides it. Will had no idea what exactly he was doing there, but all he could do at that moment was to keep running, pulling Rekka along and following Ortel's instruction to not slow down. His mind was racing, but it was running in circles. Before he even reached the end of the hall himself, the door suddenly pulled open at Ortel's behest. Meanwhile, Rekka had turned her body, and despite it seeming like her injury was already wrecking her entire body, she used the fact that Will was doing most of the walking for her and fired more shots down the hall blindly deterring anyone who might have wanted to follow them. Will quickly made it out of the door Ortel opened for them, 
running right past, expecting the man to join right up. However, Otto instead stayed behind for a moment longer. Will stopped as soon as he noticed it. What are you doing? he asked quickly, as Rekka fired more shots down the hall, and Will could already see people ducking away from them. Meanwhile, Otto stayed focused on the panel of that door. Almost got it, he mumbled. He looked extremely concentrated. However, the people in the hall got bolder with peeking out of their cover, as Rekka's shots got less and less accurate with each second that passed. But that wasn't even the worst of it, because a few moments later, she pulled the trigger once again to nothing but a click. No flash, no loud bang. Her ammunition had run dry. Fuck! Will yelled out, as Rekka simply stared at her empty gun, with wide eyes for a moment. Auto, we've gotta go! Almost got it, Auto repeated, as their pursuers already realised that the danger of Rekka's suppressive fire had subsided, many of them taking aim. Almost. Almost. Got it! Auto jumped up from his place next to the door and began to sprint out as the metal suddenly started to move again. He made a wild jump for it before the heavy gate could slam shut. Just as a cacophony of suppressed sounds of shots rang out from behind him, accompanied by the clanking, crashing and whooshing sounds of shots, either hitting metal or whizzing by as they flew wide of their targets. Will quickly hit the deck together with Wrecker to minimise the chance of getting hit, just before the door completely closed. Before he even knew it, Otto was already over him and pulled him back to his feet. Come on, that won't stop them long, he said, as he brought both Will and Wrecker back into a running position, immediately taking Wrecker's other side as they all began running. Crazy bastards, Will mumbled, as he did his best to keep Wrecker upright and as comfortable as she could be in her position. What the hell was that? Later, Otto ordered aggressively, while running on her other side. We need to get Wrecker patched up now. Everything else can wait until later. Will nodded and swallowed nervously. Do you know any doctors on this station? He asked and looked over at Ortle. Ortle nodded. Luckily, humans aren't hard to take care of, he said, though he sounded a lot more hopeful than actually confident in that fact. We just need to find a place where we can wait safely while I arrange transport. They ran for a bit longer before they came up to a very apparently abandoned building. Within a few moments, Otto once again had the door open for them, and they all hurried inside. With no lights on the inside, they were plunged into darkness for a moment, as Will set Wrecker down to the ground, immediately taking his shirt and jacket off and doing his best at using them to put pressure on her wounds so she wouldn't lose any more precious blood. Her bleeding had already slowed down significantly from before, and he really hoped that was because her body's failsafes kicked in, and not because she was running out of blood to lose. In the meantime, he could hear Ortle make panic contact with his local connections, offering them any price they wanted, if only they could get them quickly. After he hung up again, he sighed, and Will could hear him slump against the wall, before a grinding noise indicated his body slowly sliding down until he sat on the ground. Will felt his hands quivering, however... He breathed up in the slightest bit of relief, as it seemed like they would get out of here in a bit. You two really saved my bacon there. Remind me that I owe you both, he said with a shaky voice, doing his very best to keep the mood at least a little bit light. Wrecker didn't react. It seemed like her consciousness was finally surrendering to the injury she had received, as her body went into battery-saving mode. Will had honestly not expected her to reply. However, he had expected at least a tired scoff out of Ortal. However, there was nothing. Concerned, he stared into the darkness in the direction where he had just heard Ortal slide against the wall. He could hear soft breathing, but there was no reaction at all. Ortal? he asked into the darkness after a moment. Buddy? No answer. Only darkness. Hesitantly, Will slowly pulled out his phone and activated it. Too impatient to even turn on the device's flashlight, he simply used the dim light of the screen to illuminate the darkness, looking over at Ortle. 
three large splotches of dark red had spread over his friend's clothing. He hadn't seen them so far because he had only paid attention to Rekka. Orta had seemed so fine the entire time. He hadn't said anything. But now he sat there, breathing heavily, in a slowly growing puddle of his own blood. A bit later, Orta's people came to pick us up. Luckily, I managed to wake him up enough so he could tell me how to get the door open again. Otherwise, we would have been really screwed. His connections brought us to a doctor, and the rest is history. Will finished his explanations with a deep sigh, never quite turning his gaze off the ground as he spoke, and definitely not making eye contact with anyone. Turns out, humans aren't as easy to take care of as we thought they were, and the Xenodot's grasp of Earth germ theory was pretty lacking. They patched up what could be patched up, but they didn't have anything to really combat the infections that came later. I tried to take matters into my own hands, and you know the rest. We hid on the station because we figured that after their attack, this was the one place the people after us couldn't come back to. He glanced over at his friends, as local doctors hurried around between them, while Nia stood by and supported them, along with a consult human doctor they had called, that was now broadcast to them over her phone. The ambassador's accompaniment had graciously given up a good part of their personal medical supplies that they had brought on their journey to treat his friends. Broad spectrum antibiotics, these ones luckily clear for use on humans, were now being administered to combat the severe infections both Rekka and Nortal suffered from. Additionally, a whole two of the ambassador's accompanying soldiers were universal donors, and had donated small amounts of blood so it could be prepared and given to the two as a sort of booster that he didn't quite understand. Nia scowled a bit as she inspected the surgery scars. They were treated with tissue adhesives that weren't clear for humans as well, she mumbled. That certainly didn't help in the healing process. As soon as they have access to human facilities, they are going to need some follow-up surgery to fix up the scarring that that caused. But at least it kept them alive, so better than nothing. Still, I don't even want to imagine what would have happened to them had they been unenhanced. It's a good thing you don't follow that specific spacer trend. Will flinched at her words and shut his eyes tightly. If only I hadn't been such an idiot, he said. You are an idiot because you should have come to us right away. Then your friends wouldn't have had to suffer through so much, Coco admonished him firmly with her arms crossed. But then she mellowed out slightly as she added, but don't blame yourself for the attack. The only ones that fought for that are those who shot at you. No one else. Will exhaled deeply and looked up at the commander while leaning heavily onto his knees. I know I'm probably going to go away for a long time, but can you promise me something before I do? He asked. That depends on the promise, Coco replied professionally. Will's eyes hardened underneath his breath filter, and even if she couldn't see it, he was sure the commander could feel his gaze. Make sure you get those fuckers, and give them one extra for me, alright? He said in a low tone. The pixelated face on the commander's visor remained unmoved for a moment, before suddenly jumping into a happy, almost cat-like smirk. Affirmative. Affirmative. 